My name is Billy Lau, and uh, today I have the pleasure to talk to you about a work that we've done entitled uh, Mimesis Aegis, a Mimicry Privacy Shield. Essentially, this is a systems approach to data privacy on public cloud. And um, I have the pleasure to collaborate with Simon Chung, Chen Yu Song, Yong Jing Jiang, Wenki Li, and Alexandra Bodireva. Uh, we are all from Georgia Tech Information Security Center. So without further ado, uh, let's begin um, by motivating our work. Unfortunately, today we live in a world where users don't have much control over their personal data when it is communicated via public cloud. Software such as mobile apps has become more and more prevalent, um, but they are designed and built in such a way that user has no choice but to fully trust the public cloud service providers for the security of their data. Therefore, users face this um, all or nothing dilemma. Um, they either fully trust this uh, PCS um, or they don't use it, therefore losing utilities. And examples of this are plenty, uh, like Gmail, WhatsApp, uh, WeChat, Viber, Skype, you name it. The question is, how do we then change this status quo? In theory, the aforementioned problem can be solved if end-to-end -end encryption were to be applied on all um, communication data. However, in practice, this is really hard to achieve. And as we have surveyed, uh, existing solutions present uh, their own unique problems. Um, for example, um, most solutions require users to be trained to use custom apps or software to perform safe communication. Uh, a good example of this would be like um, users will have to use, say, a PGP client in order to send a safe, a secure email. And other classes of work have questionable data isolation model. Um, and this I will explore further when I discuss about related work. So with this in mind, we propose a solution called Mimesis Aegis, Mimesis Mimicry Aegis Shield. Uh, in short, I call it M Aegis, where we apply easily end-to-end -end encryption to users' communication data, but we also preserve user experience at the same time. And we achieve this basically by mimicking GUIs of uh, GUIs of the app of interest. On top of that, we also need to, in certain cases, interact with app of interest on behalf of user. And um, MAGIS has uh, certain properties like a good isolation model where uh, the, da uh, the data and logic is properly isolated from the untrusted entities. And our approach is basically generalizable across different apps in the same category. These apps are the ones that you have seen uh, um, I mentioned just now, and from our experience, we know that uh, our technique is resilient to app updates. So to just give a hint of how this looks like in real life, um, the screenshot here shows an example of what um, we can do. Um, when M Aegis is turned off, the user sees what the app sees right here, which is basically encoded ciphertext, and we've chosen to encode this in uh, Chinese, Japanese, Korean, CJK characters. Uh, let's see what happens when user turns on images as easy by tapping on the button here, and user now sees plain text. Um, before I explain the magic that's going on behind this, um, allow me to first compare our work with existing solutions in a categorical manner. So the first class of solutions are standalone solutions. Basically, since these solutions are usually custom made, it is no surprise that um, they can protect data confidentiality well, and also have good isolation from untrusted entities. Examples of such uh, solutions are like PGP, Giberboard, and on mobile environment, you have Tech Secure, Safe Slinger, and then um, you have also academic work like Fly by Night, which tries to encrypt uh, Facebook messages and uh, a lot of other uh, solutions outside. However, um, there are two main problems as, um, with this class of solution. Number one is that it either requires open protocol for you to provide security onto the existing uh, protocol, or you need to reverse engineer such protocol. For example, there is no standalone secure client for WhatsApp. And even if there is, um, usually the user experience will be altered because inevitably the um, look and feel of the app will be different because it is a separate different app. Now, the second class of solutions that we like to compare against is browser plugins and extensions. And this class of solutions basically um, 
allows you to provide a very transparent integration with the applications of interest. Examples of this are also a plenty, Scramble, TrustSplit, NOIB stands for none of your business, and Safe Button. The point here is that um, they, although they, they achieve different goals, but they try to do it in a very transparent manner where users do not need to take excuse me, additional steps. The problem here is that, as evident, is that um, this set of solutions are only applicable to web applications. The question is, how about mobile devices? Have we seen uh, WhatsApp um, browser plugins? So in contrast, MEGIS is a self-contained solution on end devices that do not face the same set of limitations. Now, um, there's another class of solution which basically takes the app and rewrites it or repackages it. Um, so with this, um, one can basically insert uh, security uh, checks or basically or harden the app of interest and provide transparent integration at the same time. Examples of this are uh, is like a resume presented here in uh, Usenix Security a few years ago, uh, another work called Dr. Android. However, the problem here is that when one does this, one would inevitably break app updates because you have to change the code and this causes the app, uh, app signature to change. And uh, another problem with this is that the security of the reference monitor that is inserted into these apps may be compromised because it resides in the same address space as the untrusted entity. Having said all this, let's look at how our work addresses these limitations yet preserves the positive properties that we've seen uh, through analyzing our system design. But before we dive into the architectural makeups of MEGs, let's first state our design goals. Number one, uh, we would like to offer good security, of course. And this is done by uh, having a strong isolation from untrusted entities. What exactly are these untrusted entities? I'll go into this in the next slide. Secondly, uh, besides having good security, we will also like to preserve user experience. And this can be done by having a transparent integration with existing apps. And from the developer's point of view, uh, point number three, goal number three is important. Uh, one needs to come up with a solution that is easy to maintain and scale, and we have come up basically with a sufficiently general purpose approach. So, as with any discussion about security design, it is not meaningful without first discussing about the threat model it is um, architected to protect. Hereby, um, these are the lists of the untrusted parties. Number one is the public cloud service providers, um, as mentioned in the very first slide. Now here, this does not mean that we necessarily consider the uh, PCS providers as malicious, but as, uh, from a design point of view, it simply makes it easier and uh, simpler to design systems with this entity untrusted. And since this is untrusted, um, so are the client-side apps because they come from the same origin. Uh, on top of that, we also do not trust the middle boxes between a PCS and the client-side app. Example of this would be the um, ISP. On the other hand, this is our TCB. We assume that the hardware is trusted. We also assume that the operating system is trusted to provide us with uh, sufficient isolation in, in terms of the app sandbox and also process isolation from uh, the untrusted apps on the same system. Now, another unique point here is the soft keyboard we also assume to be trusted because on mobile devices, we do not have a physical keyboard. And of course, we trust our own logic to be implemented correctly. And finally, we trust the user to basically turn on the protection when they are communicating um, data that they do not want to be eavesdrop. With this, now we are ready to analyze the architecture of MEGIS. The first component and the, the most important one that distinguishes it from other work is that is one we call layer 7.5. So layer 7 is the applications layer, and layer 8 is popularly being used to refer to the users. Since we are sitting between the application and the user, we call it layer 7.5. Now this diagram basically explains the magic that you have seen in the introduction after MEGs has been turned on. It basically is a collection of mimic GUIs that is painted on a transparent window that gives the user the perception that they are still interacting with the original app. 
Now, the questions may arise of how do we get the proper properties of this uh, mimic GUI such that they came, uh, for example, how do you know the exact coordinates and the size of such mimic GUIs? And the answer is in the second component and also the backbone of our architecture, that is the UI Automation Manager, we call the UIAM. Now the UIM gives us the context of the screen. By context here, we mean that um, what app is currently running? Which UI state is the app currently in? Um, besides that, um, the UIM also is useful to provide, um, uh, to relay user input to the underlying app. Um, example of such uh, scenario is to, to be able to click on the underlying send button on behalf of the user after MEGIS has performed the encryption and encoding. And as for keyboard input, MEGIS can directly intercept the plain text, user plain text, by rendering mimic um, edit boxes on top of the original app's edit box. The next component is the per target client app or the per TCA logic. So this basically processes the UI tree from the UIM to determine uh, the state of the current Excuse me, of the current UI, and basically after that, it, then it decides, based on the states, it decides the suitable actions for different UI states. For example, when you are just previewing Gmail uh, in the front screen, or you, when you're composing uh, a, an email message, these are separate and different UI states. And then we have a cryptographic module. The first sub-component here is the key manager which basically does the bookkeeping of applying the correct keys to the appropriate conversations. Think of this as a very efficient password manager that is integrated into images. In addition to that, various key distribution protocols, for example, um, simple password schemes, Diffie-Hellman, or whatever you want, can be implemented and plugged into images and be done in a transparent way because of the architecture. And we consider uh, this effort as an orthogonal aspect to our work. The second component is also quite interesting, is the, an encryption scheme we devised to allow search over encrypted data without server modification. Now, although this is very interesting, we do not have the time to go into the details of this. If you're interested, please refer to our paper. So, um, having this said, um, it is best to illustrate how the, the user perceives the usage of um, our app with a demo video. So, after installing MEGIS, you will see a shield icon that is always on top of the screen. So, this is MEGIS' main interface. It tells you the status of protection. By default, it is turned on. Now let's see how images can be used to protect our WhatsApp messages. Let's chat with Bob. So images will initiate a secure key exchange protocol, and this can be customized to whichever protocol uh, that is suitable when you first when you send your first message. And when your friend comes online, images that is installed on his device will complete the key exchange. Once the key exchange is complete, all subsequent message will be fully encrypted. And each encrypted message is encrypted by a lock icon, as you can see. Now, as you are chatting, note that features like autocomplete, spell check, and swiping across keyboard still work as usual. To see what's happening in the background, turn off images by tapping on the shield icon. It now turns red. As you can see, M Aegis encrypts and codes all your conversations, so WhatsApp only has encrypted contents. Therefore, no third party, including WhatsApp, can read your messages. You can now be assured that your communication is private. With that, I'd like to move on to uh, some evaluations, beginning with per uh, performance numbers. Um, basically, we, run, we implemented our prototype and uh, experimented on uh, stock Android phones, which are, which are LG Nexus 4 devices, running Android 4.4.2. And each experiment is repeated basically 10 times, and the average is taken. 
So for previewing the encrypted email, um, it takes on average 76 milliseconds to render plain text on layer 7.5. And this is well within expected response time, which is 50 to 150 milliseconds. And the composing and sending of encrypted email, uh, we basically leverage the Enron email database as a represent representation of what uh, uh, email, normal emails will look like. And for this, we perform a worst case scenario where, uh, where we try to encrypt the longest email uh, with 953 words, of which 362 are unique. It took 205 milliseconds to encrypt, build a search index, and encode. Now this, of course, is a worst case index. A worst case scenario, uh, we don't expect that a normal user would send 953 words on their mobile device. Um, so with this, I'm ready to conclude. Uh, in conclusion, users can now regain control over the private data using our system, where the guarantee is that the plain text is never visible to the client apps or the service providers and any, or any uh, middle boxes, and the original while preserving the original user experience. For developers, this technique is generalizable to a large number of apps and is resilient to app updates. And with that, I'll open up to questions. Hi. Thanks, Billy. We have time for a few questions. Hi. Uh, okay. Um, I wanted to ask you about the UI components with this. I didn't understand. Do you have to do UI components for each application, and how's that work done, et cetera? Okay. So, for in in general, the or the operating system or the framework provides a native uh, UI rendering. So basically, what you need to do is just to choose the correct UI. Let's say, uh, is it a text box, or is it a button, or is it an edit box? And you just need to. Who's you? Sorry. Who's you? Or the developer. The, the developer of the application, the developer the, of the. Uh, of, of our system. Of your system yes. would do it. So it's a per application overhead to. Correct. To, okay. Thank you. Yep. Bill Aylo, uh, University of British Columbia. Thanks for the talk. Um, question, your threat model, do you assume that the service provider and obviously then the app on the phone are honest but curious or are they, can they can try an active attack against your system? Right, so as mentioned actually um, is that we assume they are honest but curious. Okay, um, and then do you have, I mean if the original app doesn't support, let's say a tag of things like private text box versus public, how do you deal with that? I see. So from our experience is that um, most apps, especially um, the form, uh, the, the class of uh, messaging apps, they use, they simply use uh, uh, native, uh, native UI widgets from, that's provided by the operating system, which then we are able to get information of what type that is exactly. Okay. Thanks. Steve Bellavan, Columbia University. Did you do any formal evaluation to see how users reacted to the system, whether it's uh, take, you know, another button that they have to tap or anything like that. Did they use it correctly? Did they like the difference? Did they not mind the difference? Did they not notice? Did you do any right. evaluation so, like that? Good question. So um, I'm sorry, I actually did not include in this talk, but in the paper, we actually describe a user acceptability study. Uh, in this study, we actually, what we did was we recruited a number of students and we asked them to see if they can, uh, they can perceive noticeable differences and to see if uh, the level, basically the level of acceptance uh, of applying such a layer onto the uh, target app. And? Um, well, the, the conclusion is that they, uh, they do not perceive noticeable, noticeable difference, and uh, whatever the encryption is going on is uh, basically tolerable. Okay, thanks. Good afternoon, Giselle Font from University of Chile. Uh, we usually share images through this messaging system. Are you envisaging uh, in the future upgrade of the system have encrypted images or other media? Right, that's a good question. So um, there are several aspects to the answer to the question. Is that uh, um, number one is that um, from the UIAM component just now, uh, we can easily extract text from the application, but the this particular uh, interface does not provide us with the like the bit information of what is being drawn on the screen. That is the first uh, first obstacle. The second part is that. Um, uh, 
there needs to be a form format abiding uh, input to the uh, apps. For example, if you encrypt a picture and become random bits, the, it, it could be rejected by the underlying apps as uh, an invalid picture and so on. And even if you have that in the correct uh, format, uh, it will go through some, uh, most of the time, especially image multimedia, it will go through a compression, which will then uh, cause it to be not very compatible with encryption schemes. So you first need to have encryption schemes that can survive compression, for example. Thank you. Okay, yeah. we have time for one last quick question. I see a question from Newcastle University. Who chooses the keys? I see. So we, we leave this as orthogonal. Um, as pointed out, um, you can choose whichever key distribution sy uh, system that suits your usage the best. Um, let's say if you want to go with password base, and you can assume that there's an out of band uh, communication for password, and then you can apply it directly onto this. Or you can use, like um, what I showed in the demo video, a Diffie Hellman, which is negotiated automatically. <laughs>